the biggest win for OpenAI to do this and to get to that like 100 million user mark within like a month is that they've gotten people hooked. And so the more people started using it, the more data that they're contributing. And then there's a, an effect called flywheel effect. Basically, if you're able to provide a great experience, it drives to more usage, which generates more data, which provides more feedback to the AI system to then improve, provide a better experience, get more users who are gonna generate more data and then they're gonna better the machine learning basically or the, the generative AI technology at this point. And that's why I think, you know, you have you have all of these other kind of companies still trying to compete, but quality of what they're putting out or the quality of their models and the features and basically the value add behind those systems, they're not able to catch up because ultimately they've yeah. lost, I don't know, a lead time of six months of getting, getting that momentum of, of data, that usage, that feedback, and in order to improve that systems. Welcome to AI Master's Voice, the podcast that bridges the gap between AI innovations and the practical application in business and society. In today's episode, we are delving into critical issue at the heart of AI adoption in the business world. The vital role of head of AI or chief of AI and the essence need for a well-defined process before leaping into AI integration. We will explore how AI without a clear problem to solve can lead to missed opportunities and misaligned expectations between AI developers and businesses. Our focus will be on bridging the communication gap between those two worlds, ensuring they can effectively collaborate to drive mutual growth and innovation. Today, we are joined by Slana Makarova, a visionary AI leader known for her insightful perspectives on bridging the gap between the cutting-edge AI technologies and business strategies. Flana's insights illuminate how businesses can navigate the complexities of AI adoption, ensuring they are not just adopting technology for its own sake, but leveraging it to solve real business challenges. I'm your host, Martin Jokob, founder of AI Masters Agency. We are passionate about understanding the intersection of AI and business and how leaders like Lana are making it more accessible and impactful. You won't want to miss this conversation. Stay tuned as we explore these topics and more right here on AI Master's Voice. And last but very important thing, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do it now and click that bell button to get notifications about our new episodes of AI Master's Voice. So, Svetlana, welcome to AI Master's Voice. How are you today? Tell our audience more about yourself and how you ended up in the AI industry. Thank you for having me and thank you for such an awesome introduction. I was just like sitting welcome. there and um, you really compose yourself, I'll tell you that. So just for the audience, you know, there's a lot of things kind of mm -hmm. happen behind the scenes. So I'm smiling because I can't believe just like the five minutes ago, we're struggling through some some technical experiences and then, you know, Martin just kind of put his game face on and like did such an awesome introduction. I'm really impressed. So thank you for having me. I'm Svetlana Makarova. A lot of people call me Lana if it's easier for, for folks. So I've been working in product management, so solving you know problems for customers for over 10 years for sure. So when people ask me, well, has AI changed your job? I say it's increased my arsenal of different approaches that I could use to solve for customer problems. And so I think, you know, AI came into my world a few years ago when I was tasked with implementing or overseeing an implementation of a strategic project that was a direct request from, you know, the C-suite. Okay. There was high stakes um, and failure was not an option. And so I had to be quick on my feet, learn, but then I also had a big development team and other people, basically other work streams that were supporting me in order to take this project and, and make it succeed. So it was in everyone's interest to succeed, but me as the leader, I had to navigate that path really quickly. I had to get up to speed with AI. And I think, you know, we've been kind of successful in scaling that that product across the enterprise. And I think that's gotten a lot of eyes. Well, you, you know, you, you guys can actually do it quickly if, if implemented correctly, if you follow, you know, certain strategic frameworks for how to implement AI. And so since then I was asked by our C-suite and other leaders within the organization, hey, you should be more vocal about AI across the organization. And my, my next question to myself there was, 
why only the organization where I could speak to to more folks about it the because I'm one. very, very passionate about the topic. And that's why I've come to LinkedIn and there's just been overwhelming positive responses to kind of level of experience that I bring from the implementation side, but also the business side. And then it's just kind of taken off from there. So I'm happy, you know, to even be here speaking about the topic. So thank you for having me. So really, I was impressed. You know, I started following a lot of people just for AI topic. I was saying to you the last time when we talked, you were really different. Your uh, copies were really different. And especially when I know how you can write copies with AI, of course, you can use AI to, to write them. But when you understand the voice, what exactly you are trying to say and what target group you're trying to reach. And for me, it was like a no brainer. One day we should talk <laughs> together. I'm really glad to, to have you here. And I believe you can bring a lot of uh, new things and especially for the folks from the business world. Yeah. I'm not talking about the AI world and we will run into this uh, really quickly. Why these AI artificial and scientific world and the business world, they are really different and they cannot talk with each other. And I believe you are trying to fill up the, that gap. You're trying to understand one side and another side and talk as I call it, in human language. Yeah. yeah. And this is where what we will talk about today. And at the same moment, I, I come to this uh, interesting topic. And by the way, I think on LinkedIn, I saw the discussion about who is head of AI, who is chief of artificial intelligence. So I would like to jump on this topic and to try to understand what skills and knowledge that person should have and maybe you think, I'm not sure, are you calling yourself head of AI or you're trying just to be between those two worlds of business and AI and be a voice of AI? Let's talk and discuss what skills should have that person and who will manage the AI projects in the, in the companies, especially in uh, small businesses, like who, who should take that role, who should take that lead, maybe not full role, but the lead to be a head of AI. What's your opinion? Yes, and I think... Um chief AI officer just in general is a new title that I think a lot of organizations are still trying to understand as you've kind of mentioned well what does that entail what's kind of the skill sets what are the minimum requirements that are needed in order for you to serve that role hmm. so I think a lot of that is still still being defined and so different organizations hire into that role for different reasons and I've seen startups hiring um, kind of folks that I in my perspective again may not think they have the right skill set, but again, to each organization their own and how they define it sometimes. And I'll just kind of preface it. There's no hard and fast rule for whether you should or should not have this. I've also kind of met and heard uh, about even the chief technology officers embracing AI and expanding again to their skill sets to do, all, you know, not just traditional software engineering, but also take on specific tasks. I've, I've experienced also, or, um, skill sets that are related to AI. I've also met kind of leaders of organizations where they have a data analytics and data science kind of part of the organization. You know, the leaders who are heading that direction, so that, that department or that uh, vertical within the business. So you don't necessarily, it's not about the title. I think it's, it's what do you actually need in order to succeed in the age of AI? It's a topic, it's a hot talk topic. So I think it's, it's worth describing as to what is that role, whether it's again, a CTO that has picked up additional skill sets or a data analytics and, and science, you know, chief of, of that de department or vertical. But ultimately it comes down to understanding what AI entails and then being able to manage the end-to-end -end process for implementing it and then overseeing adoption across the organization. So AI is an intersection between, you know, technology. So there's basically infrastructure, there is models, and then there's data. At minimum, I think, you know, the, the person who comes to into that role needs to understand, again, the technology side of, of, of things. And those are the three core pieces that make up AI. And you have to really understand what, what those components are and how to enable them in the organization to set the organization up for success as you take on more and more use cases 
and start to scale them. But then as you rightfully mentioned, you know, technology is just one side of AI. There's the culture as, you know, aspect of it too. So there's the human aspect, the business aspect of it. So when I talk about this, just think about these two Venn diagrams kind of overlapping each other. AI is in the middle and then you have the technology on one side and then you have basically culture, people, business on the other side. One of the things that we often see in AI is people kind of chase technology first without kind of ignoring the business side and ignoring kind of the people aspect is like, well, I need AI in my business. How do I, where do I fit it? But I think it's, it's really important to, to have the business acumen to understand how to lead in the age of AI. So how to actually plan and, and uh, strategically think about AI in the organizations. One of the things that these business leaders need to understand is that, you know, for any C-suite executive, you know, the, the one thing that their responsibility is to make sure that their business grows. And there's two aspects yep. to growth in the business. There is, you know, how do you, maintain your top line performance through increasing revenue or providing more customer value. And then how do you do that at the least amount of cost? So how do you improve efficiencies across the organization? If you start there and then you start kind of ideating, I think we're going to get to the process um, and how we actually ideate some of these kind of use cases for it. But ultimately, that's how you should think about it. This is what problems am I solving here? How do I drive more revenue into my business? And how can AI help with that? And then how do I provide better efficiencies across my business? And how can AI help with that? AI is basically a, an enabler rather than the driver of, of change in the organization. So I think it's a, it's a balance between those things. And so the AI chief officer has to kind of have that balance, understand both sides. How do I drive value to the organization and like what matters to the organization and then um, understanding the, having the technical expertise to understand how you can actually support those objectives. Yeah. And in one of the comments, I, I said what, you know, the head of AI should have really different types of knowledge and skills. Uh, he or she needs to have CMO role, uh, CTO role, COO, operation officer, and so on and, and so forth. But this is just my opinion, yeah. of course. Uh, but, but I'm coming to this again and again, talking with different experts in AI industry. What is really important, and you already mentioned this, if you think about AI, first of all, you need to know the process itself. Yes. And you need to have the process itself. And this is where I find it out even before the AI become this bubble and the new thinking on the digital world, I was talking with companies and helping them to uh, figure it out their process. And I'm a marketer, so mostly I, I was doing the process in marketing. Mm -hmm. but. My process approach was a little bit different because I'm an engineer. So I'm looking at everything like a system. <laughs> and uh, my goal was to understand not only the marketing part, but like how we will execute. Like we need, I don't know, hundreds of landing pages in one day. <laughs> Do we have team what can enable it to create those 100 pages? Or we need copies uh, for this and uh, emails and et cetera, and et cetera. And we need to run it and test it on ad uh, networks uh, really fast. You know, in two days, we need to have the information. Does it work? Isn't it working? And so on. This is where I was going through. We need to have a process. We need to have people. We need to have tools ready and work. And I was building the process. And when I'm coming to their companies, they were waiting for me. Okay, let's talk about marketing. And I was talking all the time <laughs> about the process. And, you know, it was not easy task to do to make sure they had the process. And they couldn't understand why. Yeah. And now when we are living in the AI world, you know, what I see, if you have the process, you have ability to see where you can implement AI and make that process much faster, cheaper, or, you know, easier. Yeah. So what is your approach? And, you know, uh, I would like to talk about the process mapping and you helping other companies to understand this. You're talking between the C-level officers, yeah, and trying to help them to understand where they can implement AI because they just hear the word AI. Mm -hmm. But where, where everything starts, uh, do you talk about process mappings and other things? Oh, that's a great question. So I think with AI and it being quite different from the traditional software um, that we're accustomed to, iPhones and others, 
I think it starts with um, understanding and laying out the foundation about AI and what these systems can and cannot do. So before even starting to lay out the process, I think it's important to wow. take a moment and pause and, and really explain what AI is and how it is different from the current approaches. So there's an element of education, if you will, just foundational understanding. And so when I talk about, you know, at, at the at the executive level, you don't need to understand the algorithms, how they come to be. You just need to know. And I think the questions that they're really asking, well, what can AI do for me? And that's ultimately what's the ROI? Usually I hear what's the ROI? Yeah. <laughs> how are we getting the money back? Exactly. I mean, how, how can you and can you have, uh, what are what are some realistic expectations that I can set for these AI implementations? You can't expect it to be perfect because none of the AI systems are, but it's also important to understand why and why that's okay. And one of the biggest reasons I think is, is the fact that it's an exponential uh, technology and it improves over time and none of the other systems do that. And so value is realized over time rather than traditional software development where you kind of launch a product and it reaches its peak quite quickly and then it basically declines over time. So it just kind of goes through that kind of cycle, but the, the traditional kind of just product kind of different phases of maturity with AI systems, you basically build it. Yes, it does take time for it to learn, but the fact is, and, and we talk about it even in generative AI is the fact that once you kind of get it learning, as long as you're feeding it data, it's going to improve over and over and over. And that's kind of why they talk about AI as being an exponential technology, but it's important to understand that you can't set really high expectations for AI systems just from the beginning and expect for it to provide an 100% accurate output just from the beginnings. Again, understanding and just laying out the, the facts and the foundations without diving into what deep learning is and computer, you know, computer vision and deep learning. And I think that's a big miss, I think, on a lot of companies and courses because they spend so much freaking time and talking about history and you know what are all of these ai technologies and how they work but then you know the business leaders are sitting there and like okay well what can it do for me how does it work like how how do i start working with it and i think that's basically the intent behind kind of getting that foundation is to basically seek answers to those questions well how does it work and then what can it do for for my business and um, look at it from two lens what opportunities can i explore or what capabilities can i leverage to drive more business um basically into my organization and then how do i improve those process efficiencies um one other thing to okay. for these organizations to think about and what i kind of evaluate is their state of maturity a lot of these organizations have not even began exploring ai space other than just basically starting to work with chat gpt and even there the employees across the organization are starting to use chat gpt but there's no way of controlling output or assessing metrics or measuring kind of success and how much efficiencies it's really gained. And so again, a lot of these uh, initiatives do need to be managed top down strategically instead of bottom up. And that way you can have more control over how you measure success in different phases of your organization maturity. So initially, you know, and, and kind of what probably makes the most sense and where there's the lowest hanging fruit for organizations that are just getting started with AI is taking out of the box tools, doing a quick proof of concept. Again, having a strategic way of utilizing that technology to, as you mentioned, like focus on a specific process and provide those imp um, improvements and measure success. That's the lowest hanging fruit right. is just focus on process efficiencies, pick up a low hanging fruit type of uh, proof of concept, and then try to use a technology that already exists. You know, I, um, I talked with some, um let's call them traditional business owners. Yeah. yeah. And they say, oh, look, you're saying what currently AI are not prepared. Yeah, but over time it will learn more. So can we wait for one year and then we, we will start implementing? But what they are missing here on what I, I'm, I'm referring to the data on what AI is learning, because if one company, your competitor is starting implementing AI project, mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't work currently the right way. Does it mean you will jump after one year and you will outperform your competitor or do it is a little bit different? Can, can you elaborate yes. maybe a little bit here? Yes. And I think um, without diving into too much kind of detail, but ultimately, you know, I'll give you an example for why ChatGPT continues to rule 
in the uh, kind of in the large language space is because they were not first to market because they that transformative technology has been around yeah. since 2017 but they democracy and, Go and google kind of uh, created those transformers Ma yeah so. exactly yeah so open ai embraced it and they're like well you know let's let's try this out and actually you know they've had smaller launches of these chatbots previously they just didn't pick up as much as this one did but the again going back to feedback and data, the biggest win for OpenAI to do this and to get to that like 100 million user mark within like a month is that they've gotten people hooked. And so the more people started using it, the more data that they're contributing. And then there's a an effect called flywheel wheel effect. So basically, if you're able to provide a great experience, it drives to more usage, which generates more data, which provides more feedback to the AI system to then improve, provide a better experience, get more users, who are going to generate more data and then they're going to better the machine learning basically or the the generative ai technology in this point point. and that's why i think you know you have gemini you have all of these other kind of companies still trying to compete but there's their quality the quality of what they're putting out or the quality of their models and the features and basically the value add behind those systems they're not able to catch up because ultimately they've yeah. lost i don't know a lead time of six months of getting, getting that momentum of, of data that usage that feedback and in order to improve that system so yes waiting in the machine learning AI AI world is not like a great advantageous movement or move. So like the quicker you either start leveraging it in your business, building out some of these systems um, and start collecting feedback data, you're going to start entering that that flywheel effect. And so then taking advantage of some of that um, exponential technology that again, it's going to be really hard to catch up to because Ooh. you are, you are going to be capturing more data. You're going to provide the better user experience and users will- And, and your own data. So you need to start yes. collecting your own data. Yes. What most of the people or uh, companies missing out. You are not waiting for the general data. General data is accessible by everyone. Yes. But your data, what's going on in your company, and that's, <laughs> how you're collecting. And that's basically the gold pot, right? A lot of people, even yeah. today, without even starting uh, in AI, I, I've said this also, is that people don't realize that they're sitting in the pot of gold. And we've been collecting data, usage analytics, everyone has some sort of website, um, maybe an app and, and other things. All of that is collecting data. But you're not putting it to use with AI, then you're just basically kind of keeping it in the vault without really kind of um, like as cash. Cash doesn't really grow with time, but how are you actually putting, how are you investing that money to actually um, get more out of that data? So again, AI is a really great use case to get started. So how are you leveraging it in order to create more, generate more data that well, gives you a competitive advantage as you, I think as you were kind of alluding to, and how do you start building out, bringing more value to your users through with that data? So again, you're entering that flywheel effect by generating more data and building up more of your assets. And I think ultimately, I think company, more and more companies will realize that, hey, we have been sitting on the pot of gold and actually we need more of it. There's different ways that we could actually use it to power different experiences with AI. So there's not just this kind of silo of data that we can just use for one AI opportunity. There's lots of different use cases where you could leverage that data and, and really power the experiences or enhance or boost the, the products that you currently have, boost the experience experience recommendations, provide better efficiencies across your organizations, um, and so much more. What I wanted to kind of tie it back to is phase one. I think diving into building some, some of these proprietary models is going to be really, really a big jump. So this is why I'm, I'm kind of rolling it back, rolling back the expectation. I think you have to go through that a quicker proof of concept first, where you could leverage some of the data that you currently have or that is proprietary and there's IP in, in that, but work with yeah. the technology that already exists. And that will give you some learning as to, okay, well, I, now I understand how the process works. And then you can expand into the next phase where you're looking to productionalize yeah. some of these systems. So you're looking to now, instead of just doing a quick focused POC, like a proof of concept, how can I start building capabilities within my organization? Again, you're using oh. data, and but you're bringing capabilities within your organizations that are powered by AI. And basically you're looking at across your organization and saying, well, how can I be strategic? strategic in implementing these AI systems. Sometimes, again, it's it's leveraging something that already exists in the cloud. You don't have to build some of these proprietary systems, but when you're strategic and you're kind of starting to look across the, the businesses and the 
what processes exist and then you start evaluating the build versus buy kind of approach to solutioning you're kind of like okay well there's a white white space opportunity this is something that nothing like this exists this is a use case for where we build our own model but again build it in a way that is a capability that could be in the end game be leveraged across different business units if you don't have if you don't build that experience if you don't build that muscle initially with those first initial use cases it's going to be hard to apply and understand where AI could be u- utilized to Boom. build out those capabilities. And then I'll just kind of stretch it a little bit further. Then you're like, okay, well, I build these capabilities. Yeah, now what? Now you're looking at the next level, which is like the expert level where a lot of the AI companies are. And you hear a lot of this, like the Googles, the IBMs of the world, they're saying, well, we've already implemented thousands of use cases of generative AI or ML across our organization. You're like, how? Like AI hasn't been around for that long, like, or generative (laughs) AI hasn't been out for that long. How can you have done that? Well, they're platformatizing um, their approach to AI. So instead of, again, building these like one-off point solutions across the organization, they're looking across different verticals and they're like, okay, well, you know, there's five different business units that are looking at recommending products to uh, across these different platforms. Let's build a recommendation okay. engine as a platform and let these business yeah. units customize them to whatever they need. So they're basically doing a big mm-hmm. ballpark of that work to create, again, that platform of an AI solution. And then they are letting all of these verticals customize them. But you're built once and then okay. you basically leverage some of the same technology. And that's that's what builds efficiency. So you build that solution yeah. once and exponentially you've had five different business units at the same time leverage it. And then same thing with generative AI, you basically customize a solution to a specific point mm-hmm. like for it to do summarization or for a specific task. And then you look, hey, how many business units can actually benefit from this technology? Let us customize it to your liking um, or for what you need. And then mm-hmm. let's let's roll it out. But I think that that's, again, it, it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's very yeah. much alike to working out, right? You're not going to build a six pack in uh, a month's time. So you have to kind of start going to the gym and start training and and building up that muscle. So again, going through these phases, understanding, okay, well, where can AI really help? And going back to your question about like, well, Mm -hmm. where do you even get started? I think it's, it's journey mapping or process mapping. How do you, if you, let's say, if you wanted to identify the first use case within your organization where AI could really help you boost the efficiencies, you would pick, let's say a vertical, let's say marketing, I think, as you've mentioned, and you would just kind of highlight and then roll right out the whole process and for how long each task it takes for a user to do. And you could even mark, you can have different indicators for whether that task is repetitive. Tasks that are mostly time consuming and repetitive are prime for AI and where you could potentially, you know, look at opportunities to leverage data to enhance that particular process. And then again, you would do that across different verticals and then you would prioritize like, well, where's the biggest bang for my buck? Where can I actually get the biggest return on my investment? Is it investing in this awesome use case in marketing or provide better value if I invest in legal first? And so you're kind of at that point prioritizing like, well, if I invest, let's say $50,000 in legal versus marketing, this is basically the output that I could basically get and then you weigh those use cases at that point. If your budget allows, maybe you can do multiples, but if you're really looking for that ROI, basically the return on investment behind these initiatives, you have to be strategic in how you select them. And you know, it's it's not only the budget, it's also people inside yes. the company. How many people can run these projects? So yeah. how many head of AIs you have or <laughs> people who understand the technology yeah. or how to run these projects? Just trying to summarize this. So when do you think companies should start integrating AI <laughs> projects? When? when? After one year? <laughs> After six months? Well, I say this or a lot. And in... It's already too late. It's not too late. I think, I mean, the next best time to, to get started was yesterday. So, I mean, getting started okay. today. Uh, would so be... it's not, not, not a bad idea <laughs> to start. <laughs> and I say this I... a lot. And I, I think not from the, the point of, of instilling fear of missing out, but the idea is the sooner you get to start learning, and being active. So inaction does not give you any benefit and observing doesn't give you kind of a leg up in in your business, but actually doing something about it. If you have the desire but lack commitment, nothing is going to move. And so commitment can come in two ways is like, how are you learning about it? Are you being strategic in, in bringing in experts or mentors to help bridge the gap between a business and AI technology? 
are you picking up use cases? Are you starting to leverage or kind of be becoming more comfortable with the technology? Again, identifying use cases that you could potentially, you know, leverage in your organizations. I think inaction is probably the worst time as we kind of talked about, like the longer you wait, there's going to be more companies that emerge that see an opportunity. And, and this is what's probably hmm. going to happen is as the organizations who are kind of reluctant to change, I don't want to even say like resistant, but they're just kind of sitting there and observing. And I think 2023 well, was a year where a lot of companies companies were observing and they were just like, yeah, is this a, is this a fad? It'll probably go away. Well, Maybe it's just like another one of those 3D <laughs> printer yeah. type of you yeah, know, no. waves that will go away, but it's not going away. And I think that there's definitely no. an influx in 2024 of companies are like, oh, actually people who have adopted AI are seeing a lot of boosts in their business. And, you know, there's two things. There's new companies, what you never knew about them. Now they are trying to get your business. Exactly. <laughs> or trying to get out you from the business exactly and from the different way you never expected the startups or the people the the younger generations no. who are very entrepreneurial in nature so they're watching the market and they're like where can i no. tap into and when can i where can i create this unicorn of a solution and launch it and so they're going to look at the market and see okay well there's this product that hasn't really improved in ages maybe i can rethink that with ai and then there's going to be a lot of competition we're starting to see a lot of companies emerge with chatbots which I think is not a huge competitive advantage, but the organizations or the, the startups that are looking into deep tech or looking into developing these solutions that are, again, looking to replace some of the traditional products, those are the startups you should be looking out for because they are building something that has an IP backing to it. And it's going to take time to actually build up these models. And if they're the first to market, they're going to capture that, that market share and it's going to be really hard to catch up to. It will be almost impossible, basically. So, yeah. I, at least in my opinion. So. And we're seeing that with ChatGPT and like others, Oop. right? So like, Oop. you know, the, the faster you are, again, capturing that value, the, the faster you're improving. You see, again, that with MidJourney, DALI, right? There's a lot of other companies who have kind of emerged with their products, generative yep. AI products, but they still haven't stu stood up and like, made the name for themselves because more and more people are still using Midjourney and Dali and those systems are improving and the other systems are just not getting as much usage to improve from. And you know, like Runway and Pika in the text to video yes. prompting OpenAI comes out with their Sora solution. Of course, nobody tried it, but... But even that, like even Sora, amazing technology that they've been able to develop. But even that, it's it's going to replace another AI solution already. So it makes Runway obsolete. Why go yeah. Why go to an AI generator, generate an image, then upload it to Runway to animate it when you can just directly prompt Sora for it to create the video for you? So again, like we're already seeing even AI technologies being disrupted. And I think AI technologies, those who are disrupted every day. <laughs> Even you're of building course. something in the AI industry, in the next half year, you can be out of the industry at all. Yeah, and I think it's, um, and I'll just kind of preface that, instead of um, enticing again fear and like, oh, if we don't just start implementing it today, not everyone needs to build, you know, all of these kind of solutions. It depends again on your business and the type of processes oh, you run. Yeah. It may be too far-fetched for you guys to even need to develop your own proprietary models. Maybe you take out something that already exists or you customize it. Or you work with a vendor to customize it to a solution. Again, AI is there to basically boost whatever you're kind of doing. If you kind of think about the evolution and, and I see AI as an evolution to how we do things. So first we had mail, then we have email, right? So like that's a transformative technology. You know, first we had, you know, we were able to use, I don't know, some utensils or some, some tools in order to build a house. Now we actually use like heavy machinery to like help us with some of that. And just think of AI as, as the next evolution to actually boost the way we tackle problems. And so the way that we were mm -hmm. able to do that with traditional software development, that's basically times that by, I don't know, however many times, but that's the exponential aspect of it. It, it can work on so much data and it's like, it's it's really infinite if you're, again, depending on the, the use case, but the amount of data that these AI systems can handle is just mind blowing. And it, it develops so fast what we can even catch up 
Like every week we, we finding out what more and more data they can able to, to work on and yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll just kind of drive maybe like one more point forward just to explain why this technology is so, so different and so valuable is because if you look at, and I explain AI as like basically pattern finders. So again, if you look at how we've done uh, AI software or software development prior to AI, we looked at data and we ourselves were treating, looking at data and figuring out patterns. And then we derived certain algorithms said, if this, then that. And then you would have developers program that in and then develop an app. And so there would be these, you know, extensive logic, basically business logic rules that were developed in order to kind of support that, solving for that problem. Well, AI, and there's different approaches that they can figure out their own patterns in the in the data. And so and they can do that exponentially. There's no limit for how many, how much patterns that they can find in the data. And this is why you kind of have news talk about large language models being 90 billion parameter or like 80 billion parameter models. Those are basically the number of patterns in language that you were able to identify. 90 billion or 80 billion, it's huge. It's nothing that a human can actually sit there and, and spell out every rule 90 billion or 80 billion times. So that's kind of, again, the idea that this is this technology is truly exponential. You know, there's so much more than you can do with AI that you couldn't have done before with kind of traditional software development. I believe we will see a lot of disruption in SaaS products and SaaS products won't be like they were previously. The question, do you, do you still have time or we need to do the hard stop? I do have to have a hard stop, but we can do part two. We can we yeah. can do next week, same time. So yeah, I'm, I'm open to, to doing that huh. and we'll be like, hey, part two coming soon. So thank you for your time and yeah, I will see you next week.